Hey everybody, Jimmy Warren. Welcome to a brand new episode of Guitar Talk. Before we jump into it, I want to let you know the Guitar Talk is hosting the Chicago National Guitar Show. It's going to take place Sunday, July 17th at the Kankakee County Fairgrounds in Kankakee, Illinois, right off of Interstate 57, about 50 minutes south of the city of Chicago. We've got dealers coming in from all over the country paying top dollar for vintage gear. Uh, come on out. It's going to be a buy sell trade show. There's going to be a food truck. It's twenty dollars to get in, or you can go to Guitar Talk Official and get an early pass for fifteen dollars. It's going to be an amazing show. Hope to see you there. Now we have a guest for you that's been on my show before, and that's because I think he's just an amazing player. I absolutely uh, am uh, taken back every time this guy picks up the guitar and plays, which he does a little bit in this episode. This goes on a little bit longer than normal. This one's about an hour, I think. So uh, we had a really, really great conversation. And I'm talking about Alan Hines. Man, you know, he was an instructor at MIT, played with the Crusaders. He's done so much work. He's played with so many people. And uh, he is somebody that inspires me every time I hear him play. So do yourself a favor. Sit down, put your feet up, get a nice cool beverage, and enjoy this in-depth conversation with the one and only Alan Hines right here on Guitar Talk. How are you? Hey, Alan. How are you, man? I'm How's good, buddy. Guy? How are you? Oh, man, I'm coping. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I just forgot completely <laughs> I was lying in bed today. Going, I'm supposed to do something today, I think. And thank God, thank you, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> well, I, I, got, I, I, got, I would have gotten out of bed by now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I got a. Right, and then I didn't know. I didn't know whether I should post it for today. I didn't know it was a live thing. So. Um... Yeah. No. so beautiful so how have you been how have you been handling the the crap in the world you know keeping us all from working well it's funny you should mention that because i was just talking to a you know i made friends in the last um in the last few months with rick beato you know rick beato is right yep and he's from atlanta i'm from down there you know we have some mutual friends and uh, i wrote him after he had done a, a Joni mitchell a really, I'm a big fan of Johnny Mitchell's, of course, and he did a really great um, episode with one of his "What Makes the Song Great," where he tore it apart, got her tuning correct, you know. And I know her stuff really well, and I so I wrote him an email. I said, "Man, you did a great job," and I just want to say, you know, thumbs up. And he wrote me back and said he was a big fan of mine, which is which is flattering. Yeah. So um, he's been kind of well, you know. I finished a new CD, and so every time I talk to Rick, he goes, "Alan, what are you going to do with a CD?" Nobody has a CD player in their computers or their car or anything now. He goes, he goes, he goes the only way you can make money is if you do YouTube stuff. So and he and he like and he tells me how much money he makes, you know, and it's like it's quite impressive, you know. Yeah. And he's got a whole thing going. He's been doing it for years, of course, and he's got the whole system down with the narrative and everything. But so how have I been handling things? Well, things have been super slow because I used to go to Europe and to Japan twice a year. And I used to teach at MI. That was kind of my regular, you know, that was the bass, you know, brought everything in so I could afford to do my other musical projects, and everything, all that kind of stopped. So um, uh, I turned 65. I started collecting Social Security. <laughs> so I'm old. That kind of helps. Um, but yeah. I, I've got a new CD that I'm really um, that I'm really proud of. This thing uh, we just got it. We just got it in the mail the other day. I don't oh know yeah. You see that? But it's um, it's oh, yeah. super. It's called the Good Fight, and uh. I have a financial backer for the first time in my life. So we went to a great studio here in Los Angeles, um, East West Studios, and we recorded. So we, we've taken t advantage of this time off to um, just tweak. You know, we've added Jimmy Johnson and Travis Carlton and Lenny Castro and uh, Mike Finnegan, great keyboard player, played oh, yeah. on a song yeah. before he passed away. Um, so I've been okay, you know, but another weird thing, I don't know if you know this happened, but I'm blind in one eye. I, um, I have a detached retina. 
Yeah. So, so I haven't been able to really exercise like I like to. Um, so I'm like getting white and flabby. <laughs> I'm starting to feel everything on two and on one and three, you know. Right, right. So I, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I'm excited about the album because you know, of course, I'm I'm a guitar player, so of course I'm a fan because you're a great guitar player, and so of course you know, pay attention to it like that. I think this one's a little bit more rock oriented. I mean, it's not as fusion. I just kind of wrote whatever I felt. You, know, I wasn't trying to. I never really try to go towards. Whenever I try to write for a specific purpose, it always comes out. To me, it's very easy to see that it's just. It's not coming from from the heart, but you know I have a lot of my my deepest roots are probably in Led Zeppelin and uh, and Allman Brothers and uh, I like Little Feet a whole lot. I was a big Lowell George fan, still am. So there's a lot of slide guitar in it. Yeah, that's great. That's really that's really cool. Well, I'm excited for you. Now, have you decided to step into you know online content? You know, creating your own channel and developing well, content. I did. I've always had a channel i just never was very active you know there's a lot right. of stuff out there on me right but i came to find out when i started trying to figure out if i could monetize things because as one girl friend of mine said alan you have a million videos up there i go i know but i i didn't take any of them you know like um <laughs> my, my friend scott henderson like he's a big he's an, he's rabid about if he doesn't think he really had a great night he's not gonna let you put it up on you know and he just makes he really is uh and I don't care, you know. I mean, I just figure I'll, I'll, you have you get the bad or the good. You know, there's some good stuff and some bad stuff, and I don't want to I don't, I don't want to go crazy trying to figure out whether I played good or not. So I don't even listen to it. But there's a lot of stuff out there, and I'm not getting any money from it. So I finally, she said, let's go and see what you have. I've only put up a handful of things myself on my 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 channel, and I have like a few hundred dollars in there. I said, well, that was you know, probably collected over ten years or something, but it's still something, you know. So that and with Rick Beato, so I just made my first video a few days ago other new series if you get a chance go check it out it's on my youtube channel and i called it you know rick beato has a series called what makes this song great right okay so i called this series i said what makes this guitar great yeah. and, so, and i said but, and affordable because most of my guitars i mean i went to joe bottomas's house the other day he lives i could walk to his house from here up in laurel canyon i went right. to his nerd nerdville place you know and, you know, we, he and I are not really close, but he's a nice guy. We always talk guitars. We see each other. And he said, yeah, come over to the house. I'll give you a nickel tour. I mean, for a nickel, I got a lot, man. He has got, um, <laughs> he's got about he's got about four houses the size of my little one-bedroom cottage up here full of, I mean, literally like five deep tw yeah. vintage tw uh, tweed amps, guitars. I mean, I, there must have been, I must have seen 200 cases lined up of, of tweed cases. And he said he hasn't even played most of this stuff. He's just yeah. a collector, you know. And where I'm, uh, you know, I mean, I haven't been as fortunate as him. I'm, I'm the worst businessman in the world. But, you know, I, I have some nice guitars. I have some vintage pieces. But um, a lot of them, my better guitars that I end up playing are ones that I actually work on. You know, I, um, I like taking them apart. I like, like this, this Stratocaster is a beautiful guitar. I don't know if you can tell, but it's, um, it's gorgeous. It's like a 65 neck, and the pickups are from 56, and the body's from 62. It's just like this crazy but it's a really good Frankenstein. I set them up to where they sound good. I have some old Les Pauls and um, anyway, uh, so Rick Beato said, Alan, the only way you're ever going to make any money is if you do YouTube stuff. I think that's where I was coming back to, but uh, you know, Joe Bottomasa, uh, he's, he's kind of figured some stuff out too, I think. Um, uh, well, his whole team, Bonamassa's whole team, when it comes to marketing and promotion, I mean, absolute uh, genius. You know, I mean, I subscribed to his uh, fan club years ago and, you know, every single day, I, you know, sometimes more than once a day, I get something from Joe and, yeah. uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, every, everybody does. And, you know, when you go to yeah. Guitar Center, there's Joe Bonamassa, you know, Wawa pedals and picks and straps and, you know. Yeah. He, con he condoms. Joe Bonamassa con no, I'm kidding. There you go. Hey, you know, this is this is kind of off topic, but do you know Jimmy Steinfeld? I don't think so. Jimmy Steinfeld uh lives in Laurel Canyon right up the road at uh, uh to the top of the hill from Joe Bonamassa. He just on, recently sold his place up there, you know. Stan Stanley yeah. Hills or is it um on Mulholland or Oh, I, boy, that's a really good question. You know, it goes off onto a private road. 
Oh. Uh, on the side. Of, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of little ones like Appian Way. There's some really small places up there in the hills. Yeah, yeah I, I guess it was owned by somebody who had something to do with Star Wars. It was like a producer or something for Star Wars. And there's a the little. Hills, the hills are full of that kind of stuff up here, you know. Ah, it's gorgeous. I, he just recently sold it, but I've been up there to to parties many, many times. And when Joe moved into the neighborhood, I happened to be out there and, and he took me down and he said, okay, here's Joe Bonamassa's driveway. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I was at Joe Bonamassa's place. He's got a security camera on every piece of his property. He has this huge yeah. TV in his kitchen where he has like all these security things like on his front door, back door. And he's yeah. got a great, I think it used to be owned by, um, I think it was owned by um, Oliver Liebert. I think the guitar player producer, I think Joe Bonamassa's place was, I mean, it's really nice. And yeah. you know, Joe's a sweetheart. He's a really nice guy. He let me use his amp on my CD. I was in the studio and it, was, it just happened to be there. And the engineer knew him uh, better than I did. And he said, Hey, can Alan Hines use it? And he goes, sure. So he's, he's a nice, generous guy, you know, and he's got a lot of stuff going on up there. Um, yeah. Really what cool. I was going to say about all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a collector and a tinker. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I, so I started this series called What Makes a Guitar Great. And when I told that to Rick Beato, he goes, hold it, hold it. He goes, I'm already in a couple of lawsuits, you know, suing people over using what makes this whatever, whatever. You know, <laughs> what makes this great. So I said, yeah, but I put and affordable. And he goes, right. oh, that's different. You know, so he, I'm a friend of his, so he kind of <laughs> let me slide on that. But I did my first one. It's up on YouTube now where I talk about <laughs> this strat and how I got into it fairly cheap. I mean, any of these parts on an, on the complete original guitar would be anywhere from you know twenty five to fifty thousand dollars, but I ended up getting because the you know the, the tuners were routed out and I found bushings for it and it's been refretted the, the guitar the body's been refinished but it's nicely done and the pickups were rewrapped so I got into it for kind of a song just parts through the years and a lot of the trick is putting it together you know to to bring out the love of an instrument how it's set up yeah I mean, if I keep looking at you weird it's because my eye is not you no know, you. You're you're fine, Alan. Well. You're fine, Alan. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, well, the guitar's great. I did see I did see the thumbnail for your uh, for your series, and that I hadn't had an opportunity because I. I just I, did it last night or yesterday, I think. Yeah, because I end up doing like sometimes I'll do three or four interviews a day. You know, like I was on with Billy Sheenan right before you. So. Cool. It's, it's Where are you cool. located? Uh, I'm in Chicago. Chicago, that's right. Yeah, I'm in the Chicago area, but I'm doing this this new series. Uh, we we launched Guitar Talk TV, and we've got a new series on there that we're calling the Business of Guitar, because one of the things that I get from so many people around the world is they you know they ask questions about various aspects of making a career out of the guitar in one fashion or another. Why well, it's so different now than it was? Yeah. Um, how old are you, uh, Jimmy? I'm fifty seven. Okay, we're pretty close. I'm yeah. 65. I just 65. So, I mean, you know, you remember the good, the world. I mean, I I was never um, that successful as a solo artist back when I was like 20 years old. You know, I was still just playing in top 40 bands and and you know came out to MI when, when I was 28. So I started late out here, but you know, just for, I know everybody in the business now out here. I know a lot of people, and I just and I've known the business somewhat, even though I wasn't really in it directly at back then, but it's just so different now, you know, it's not about, you know, no record company is going to find you and pair you with somebody like they did with Elton John until they found the right lyricist to make your songs great. You know, you kind of got to come in the front door with guns blazing with stuff already happening. And there's so much stuff out there, man. I was with my eye, I have this detached retina. I've been going back and forth to the hospital for like, I've been blind for like seven months now. It's hopefully going to be over in about a month or two. But every day I'd get in a, uh, well, for several days, for a few weeks there, I was taking Uber to the hospital. It's like a 30 minute drive. And these Uber drivers, several of them all were trying to get into the music business and they all had demos and stuff to play for me. And they were all great. I mean, they were playing the shipping. I was going, whoa, man, the production on this is awesome. And I can, I mean, you know, we really tried to go an extra length on my CD with um, really good mixers and mastering and really good drum sounds and the engineering. But these guys are really hip to like, um, you know, different synth bass sounds with, you know, just this really god awful, beautiful bottom end bass. It wasn't all of my style of music, but the sonically, it was like just some great stuff. So I don't know. And they're like asking me how they can get into the business. And it's like, yeah. oh man, I don't know anymore, you know? 
Right. And, and, and it's, it's even drastically changed just over the last two years, you know, because you, some people made their living, you know, playing live and, you know, or teaching at a college, you know, where there were students at, is the college even open? I mean, you guys work in it. Partially open. Yeah. They'd ask me to come back to do a, like a, a day every week. And I just financially, it's not really, I mean, I, they'll i mean they if they give me two days i'll go back it's just not really worth it for me to drive down there and park in hollywood for a day but they're kind of open but yeah not really not not to the extent where they can hire me back like the hours i had before yeah um, yeah that's see that's too bad and so it forces people in order to you know to do something else and that's why i see you know you've seen so many guys you go into online content or do facebook live shows or you know some live streaming or something like in order to you know that's why rick beato was saying to me he's he kind of makes fun of me all the time whenever we start we, we, he calls me about once a week we talk about stuff and um you know i was doing this master class for about the year of COVID. i did a master class once a month with john harrington yeah the guitar player for the steely dan we had this really cool little concept i thought it was a great idea mm -hmm. uh, where I, we, I put a backing track together for a student of like two minutes of all blues or just a blue shuffle or maybe even a steely dan song or something but just two minutes send it to the student they record themselves playing on it they send it back to me and i put it in a playlist and we listen to it in the zoom and me and john critique their playing and talk about what they did right what they did wrong all that kind of stuff so it was really it was really a fun idea um but that's how you know <laughs> that's uh i mean like i was saying nobody even has a cd player anymore yeah um, we had to think of i mean i just think it's you have to be inventive and try to find some way to i mean i can't imagine if you're a young kid I don't know where you begin. I mean, there's so much stuff out there, and the internet is endless. It's just a, you know, it's, it's just outer space. It's just like endless space of music, and you know, most of the way here is is terrible. And I turn it off pretty quick, but I'm still searching for stuff all the time. But I miss the old days. We can just get a CD or a, or an album and and open it up and see who's on it and sit back and enjoy it. But um, those days are numbered. You know, this is going by the way of an ADAT. Or like a you know cassette, um, yeah. yeah. I don't know, but yeah, it's changed radically in the last two years. It's kind of accelerated and it's kind of like gone. And so yeah. I don't know what the thing is. I don't know what to tell young players. I just <laughs> figured that something will happen. You know, I mean, I didn't really know at the time what I was doing um, when I was younger, and I just kind of loved guitar so much that I just kept playing and kept trying for gigs just because I for the love of playing. And now that I'm 65, I don't see me really doing a whole heck of a lot of touring the next. 20 years I mean, you never know so i'm i'm stretching out and trying to do this youtube thing and seeing if i can do it and still see keep some integrity as a guitar player yeah you know, I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna dance around in a hat or anything on, on my you know my you know i'm gonna do anything crazy on my channel but i try to push my music some but um and i don't really want to be a youtube geek i never thought i'd be i don't want to be that guy who just sits around and shows scales or you know yeah. it's a whole different thing but you know on the other hand doing your show today we're going to reach a lot of people just because yeah. it's you know the advent of the technology is wonderful in that way so i guess you have to find a, your personal niche your personal narrative that can kind of set you apart from somebody else mm -hmm. i don't know you know there's that and then there's also you know teaching at mi just people ask me what do you do with a student who, who has no talent you know and i um i won't mention the guy's name because you know him but we were talking the other day about teaching at mi and, and i said well you know, I've always thought that everybody has something and my students who seem the least talented at the time, but they were really um, interested, seem to always find a way. So I guess, you know, it, just like we do in life, you, you'll find a way and you'll find a way to get it out there and get it on in a movie or you have a friend that gets a commercial and you get it on a commercial or I'm, I don't know, you know. Yeah, well, it 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 appears that, you know, nowadays you have to be fluid in a lot of different things like for yourself you know you you work at uh the the college plus you play live you put out your own original material you have to do a variety of things in order to you know make it a, a full-time career because sometimes you know it's really difficult to just do one or the other yeah, there's, there's some guys who were lucky through the pandemic who had these road gigs yeah um, you know, with bigger bands that were able to go perform uh, wherever they wanted to in places where they weren't really doing the mask mandate or uh, 
they took enough precautions. Like John plays with Steely Dan. Um, I was talking to Jimmy Johnson, who's out with, J- with James Taylor, Michael Landau. You know, they were doing COVID tests like every day. Yeah. They were really safe, you know. they Because they were big enough draws, they could go and do these big arenas, you know, these big venues. Where a lot of guys, you know, on the next level down, their work was just gone. I, my, the, the guy who's supporting my CD financially owns a company called AEG. Well, he's a, the CEO of AEG, which is a big yeah. promote like Live Nation. And right. so he's, um, uh, you know, he's doing Elton. He does Elton John and Taylor Swift. And boy, talk about, I mean, in a period of like a couple of weeks, they shut down everything around the world, you know. So yeah. their world really changed. This is now starting to open up a little bit for, for them. So I don't know, you know, for, yeah, for me, I've just, um, I'm excited about my new CD because it's by far, I mean, people, you always say that about your latest project, but this one we put more, it's definitely my most um, ambitious project for sure. Mm-hmm. My songwriting, the playing, the musicians and the time we took to mix it and make it sound good. Uh, yeah, I think, I think. I can just hope for something happens with it, you know, put it out there and see if somebody bites and uses it on something or likes it or I, I, we don't really don't know. He thinks my key is to do more touring. You know, if the world ever opens up, he wants to maybe get me opening up for a bigger band, you know, uh, not necessarily a fusion tour. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I just told him, I said, you know, I'm 65. I don't want to be driving like in a Conaline van through the snow in Wisconsin, you know, in the middle of January. You know, I don't want to do right. that kind of tour anymore. I've kind of paid those dues. You know? Right. For seven hundred dollars, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. It's yeah. Trying to drive. Well, you know the well that the the gentleman you're connected to has the ability to put you in in the right places. That's for sure. Well, we hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, I mean, I just did a book that just came out. Um, called I just got it in the mail yesterday. It's called. Oh, nice. The uh, Fusion Blues Guitar Solo. It's a place out of London. It's back when I could. That's back when I had a tan. I playing, I playing you can go outside you want to go huh yeah you go outside well i used to be such a, i'm a tennis nut i used to play like six days a week and that's how this the the well detached retinas don't necessarily have i didn't get hit in the ball in the eye of the ball i just i started getting floaters and then i and then they got really bad and i went in they said yeah detached they said it was just old age it's just kind of random stuff yeah but uh yeah i missed it so i've had a lot of time this last few months to to do some soul searching right <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it's 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 weird because i've I, you know i come across guys that are just uh, flat out amazing and uh you know th- they're in the same boat i don't know do you know a guy by the name of harry mira yes he was from chicago yes yes harry you know, do you know larry Kimpel? yes larry and i we're dear friends back in the day. We used to, we had several bands together and they used to play together. I knew Harry from him. I saw Harry. I think I met him at the NAMM show one time. Yeah. He was very much like a Larry Carlton. Right. Uh, right. He, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, he did the video game series, uh, Halo. He did three of those in that played the music, yeah. this background. So that's right. Video games and stuff. Yeah. Well, he doesn't know. No, he was, he just did Halo. Okay, that okay. was the only one he did but he you know he toured with he did blues guys you know like uh, james cotton and sugar blue played with dickie betts elvin bishop oh awesome uh, i remember him being good i remember i think we met did we talk yeah. about him? i remember seeing him i think i was when i was in, on the road someplace in chicago with randy crawford years ago and we went out to see him i think larry told me he was playing or i was in touch with him i can't remember boy sometimes yeah yeah well, you know, I, I just, I, you know, I just talked to him earlier because him and I play together sometimes. We do some shows together, and uh, you know, he's always talking about you. He's always talking about your tone and oh, always cool. talking about your videos and stuff like that. You know, he's somebody that really pays close attention, you know, to what you do. Is he still around? He is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, him and I are doing a show. We're opening up for Eric Gales in St. Louis. We're doing, you know, I like Eric. Yeah. Yeah, Eric, Eric's, Eric's really good. So, so, you know, what, you know, one of the things that, you know, is, is fascinating about you is the fact that you've dedicated you know, a portion of your life to teach, you know, into, uh, you know, to invest in other people. And so as a part of this series, you know, there are people that are looking 
to make that kind of career choice. You know, they're passionate about guitar, but at the same time, they're passionate about helping other people be successful playing the yeah, guitar. Yeah, I love it's a it's a it's a well. I when I first graduated from MI back in the eighties, they run the actually the day I graduated, they gave me a job at MI. It was a they had a class at um, Tommy Tedesco and Howard Roberts and Pat Hicks were there, and they were they were they able to have these. Um, a suggestion meetings where they'd have the whole student body and they said, what can we do to make the school better? And somebody stood up and said, hire Alan Hines. <laughs> and they did the next day, you know, I, Tommy Jessica goes, who's Alan Hines? I ended up buying a couple of guitars from Tommy uh, while he, when he was sick. But um, anyway, so I got the gig there and I, at first it was just, a, it was, a, it was kind of fun to be teaching at MI. I wasn't really taking it that seriously. Right, that's my cat. Um, and then, but then through the years, man, I, I, I realized how good it felt to like mentor somebody or make a difference in somebody's life or to really get through to somebody, even, even if it's a little bit of theory or fretboard knowledge, you know, if I could do something and they go, Oh, wow, I never looked at it that way. And it helps. It was like, Oh, it was, um, it was a really good feeling of satisfaction. So I ended up putting a lot of thought into my workshops, uh, that I used to do in Japan and in Europe. Um, and I had, I think I have some different takes on how to explain fretboard to people, some real simple techniques that seem to just in the last, year really i've kind of come up with some new ideas that i think are very helpful the students i give a lot of lessons online still and um and it's it's funny because sometimes i'll get guys who are really good and um i have a couple of exercises that still stump them they really it's funny i like to give them the exercises and push them in that boat out into the water you know because i like that kind of stuff that makes you you kind of get the concept and you can work on it it's not i mean i, I mean when you just hand somebody a piece of paper with some licks on it i don't know that's like showing them this is plagiarism kind of, you know, you kind of want them to create and learn on their own. And that's, if you can kind of get that little germ, that little seed planted, and you can kind of see their eyes light up and go, oh yeah. And they come back the next week with kind of that, that's a, that's, that's what I'm kind of going for. Yeah. yeah. Back into, I, I can show you really quick what I'm talking about. I have a couple of little quick sure. ideas. Really quick. Yeah, yeah, sure. I have, see. I have this new concept that's been stumping all my better students. And um, I'll say, well, play me any lick that covers like maybe three strings, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be anything. It can be like a, we'll pick a key, like a like A7, you know, and they'll go, uh, uh, something as simple as that. You go, I can do that. I go, we'll call out the notes to him, call out the intervals. So it's like nine, three, five, nine, root. Yeah. And then I have them go all the way up to diatonic. So if they know they know the scale where scales D major or E, e or A mixolydian. So it's so I'll do that lick all the way up. So we do call it out the note. So three, four, six, three, two, four, five, seven, four, three, five, six, root, and it it's really hard for some of these guys to really call out those intervals. And I said, well, whenever you land on a three and a five, you know, there's a chord there. So they yeah. some stop and they have to go, Oh yeah, I see it right there. And that's just an easy, like, I mean, when you get into more complicated, like, <laughs> so, you know, just to explore and learn the fretboard. And that's what it's all about to me. It's like, you know, getting out of the patterns, that's that, you know, because um, probably seven out of every 10 guitar players are coming to me going, man, I get stuck in these patterns. And they're just doing the Dickie Betts little, you know, you know which is okay. Right. But that, you know, when you get people that get stuck there, they don't know how it relates to anything else. So this is, these exercises are kind of meant to get people out of those uh, ruts, you know. Yeah. And, and, and we all fall, we all fall into that, you know, it doesn't matter where you are sooner or later. You fall into it. that's really that's really cool that's really cool alan and so are, yeah so the the people that are coming to you let's say for private lessons and that are, are most of them people that you know have a good basic understanding of music theory already or are they people you know that you know have no idea but can play yeah a little bit of both a little bit of both yeah so it's, it's a, you know but there's they're always searching for something you know the better players We'll come once to kind of see what I got, and then they'll kind of be on their way. You, I can tell when they're like really. You get some players who are just like they're already good and they know what they know. Um, but I always try to stump them. I like stumping the band. I like giving them something right because a lot of them have 
a lot of them think they're a lot better than they are too. Yeah. That's a common thing. It's out of insecurity or out of arrogance, you know, whichever, but uh, sometimes they'll like, um, they'll kind of get, but then I, then I can kind of see through that pretty quick too. And then I just try to give them, um, you know, simple tasks or simple homework assignments. And it's, you'd be surprised. A lot of times they say they know something. I say, well, do that, but play it really slowly starting on this place in the neck. And then they said, they're like, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. As a teacher, I mean, maybe it's just cause I've been doing it for so long and I like people and I like the guitar so much that I can kind of, and I've been there, you know, so I can tell I've been arrogant before and I've also been confident before. So, and I've, you know, I remember well, when I went to MI, I remember thinking, um, Man, you know, I know Stairway to Heaven. I know that really well, right? I know that position really well, you know. But I didn't really know it anywhere else. You know? Right. So I remember I made a point um, um, to learn it, learn to learn my positions. I, I made a point to, well, like I'm saying, you know, I learned in pentatonic shapes like everybody. But there's always like gray areas on the fretboard, and I I made a goal for myself. I said, man, I'm gonna learn those little areas that are gray. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be just as comfortable in them as I am in the ones I know. Yeah. That yeah. helped a whole lot. So that just kind of forced me to, to really, to think about what I was doing, you know? Yeah. Well, one of the things that stands out about your, your playing is, is to me is your touch. It seems like you've got a really soft, smooth, but yet really uh, controlled, you know, touch, you know, when, Thanks, when well, it looks effortless, when you play, it looks completely um, effortless. It's like you're not even trying. It's like you're half asleep. Well, that's a, yeah, uh, well, I am actually. Uh, it's the Xanax. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, that's, that comes from uh, several things. I mean, I um, I don't know why, because I didn't take lessons when I was a kid. So I held I hold the pick up, the pick, pick up. I hold the pick really strange. I hold it sideways, you know? So I don't yeah. really pick. When I was at Berkeley, they tried to get me to change and pick like Mel Bay style, but I could not do that at all. And I was... The worst student at MI, ask Dan Gilbert. He'll tell you I was the worst student there. I mean, I just couldn't do the alt when they when they would do like you know. Uh, I mean, I can do it kind of okay now, but I mean, those guys could play these arpeggios really blazing. I just could never do it. songs like um, what's that Chick Corea song? Uh, now, I couldn't do it picking like that, but I figured out a way that I could go. You know, doing it with a hammer on. Uh, whatever it was i don't remember now but uh so the advent of the weird picking uh and alan holdsworth was a big influence in my life and not 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 necessarily his writing because it was i liked some of his early stuff but some of his stuff got so out that i couldn't even understand it but his playing even if you listen to some he played on some commercial stuff with like uh level 42 uh he played with uh tony williams and some of the early stuff was wonderful jean luc ponty that's the shit i mean whenever he played solo i was just like man because he had a great touch that he didn't ever yeah. he didn't quite always get the attention for his caressing of the notes the way he did he just had a really great way of bringing out a lot of love out of one or two notes mm -hmm. uh and i love that about him when i listen to him now he could just he had a great vibrato and so anyway, in a, in my little Homer Simpson approach to trying to sound like Alan Holdsworth, I just realized that um, I could, um, if I got the action right on the guitar and um, uh, the way I pick, I pretty much only pick whenever I change strings. Uh, so I don't know if you can see, but yeah. so, uh, so I, I have my students oftentimes practice with that, they, students who want to do the legato thing. I have them practice scales without playing, without picking. And they do it really slow. Just crawl around the fretboard and see if you can, it doesn't matter if every note doesn't come out super strong, but it's like keeping it steady that's, that's important. And that, mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff, um, I have another exercise that I do give my students where I just call it, um, um, where I just stretch as much as I can. This is laterally. Uh, like if I want to go from a low note to the high note, this is a C sharp. It has 21 frets, so I'll take like E7, and I'll purposely um, make sure I stay in this, that one mode. Don't stray, because every guitar player is a little ADD. 
but I try to stay in that one mode and I don't I don't go to any patterns. So I'm going like a Trying to, I'm purposely trying to think this way, not going to any patterns that we learn, pattern five, pattern three, whatever it is on the fretboard. Mm -hmm. I want to see, I want to see the intervals as they are on one string. And I want to try to stretch. And, and if you do this for about 20 minutes, you'll find yourself kind of coming up with new uh, patterns you never thought you knew, like, you know, a little, little patterns, little jumps all over the place that you never th would have thought of had you just been practicing you know the, the traditional way i mean they're both good you have to do the traditional thing too but uh for most guitar players who have already gone through that regimen in school who know the patterns the 12 positions at berkeley or their five patterns at mi you know i try to bridge those patterns and make it into one the idea is make it into one big pattern kind of you know yeah so you know uh i i want to ask there's there's like a Pretty part of our... so i'm sorry if i'm just like get started it's like, I like I'm just spitting stuff out here. It's off the top of my brain. No, you're good. You're good. I appreciate it. You know how hard it is when you're trying to talk to somebody and you ask them a question and they go, "Yep." <laughs> that would be the worst. Oh, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, it's, I've only had it a few times, but no. What I wanted to ask is is that there is always a time in our lives, in the beginning, in the formative years, when we're you know developing ourselves as players. What do you think are some of the things that you did in those formative days that made you the player that you are right now? Well, I think playing in top 40 band was at the time I thought it was just, I was just picking, you know, drinking and picking up girls. I mean, I was just having, I was out at, I was 18 years old and I was just like, that was just so much fun back in 74. I mean, yeah, I'm super lucky, you know, in that everything on the radio had guitars in it. So we had bands and like, six nights a week i was playing four hours a night in these little smoky clubs down in georgia and florida alabama mississippi and we were playing the combination of stuff we would do a foreigner medley we'd do a steely dan medley beach boys medley singing you know all the vocal parts we're doing uh beatles medleys uh then we'd do like a, a dixie dreg song and then we would do i mean the, we could do anything i mean and back then we were throwing in some like kind of almost like fusion-esque type stuff you know People didn't care back then at the club. They didn't know what it was. It was just in between, in between the police song and the and the uh, and the uh, <laughs> the Tears for Fear song. You know, they heard this like weird Dixie Dregs medley. You know, whatever. So that gave me a really great, um, um, a really great uh, variety of styles. I think so. I've all felt comfortable playing shuffles or playing straight rock stuff or playing. You know, I know how to, I'm pretty good at composing solos, you know, I'm pretty good at like, you know, if I have to get something to work in this eight measures, like when I toured with Gino Vanelli, I was really, it was fun because I you know I'd have a 16 bar solo here and a 32 bar solo here and a four measure solo here and you, you kind of learn how to construct that to make it work for the song. Um, I would actually compose my solos for him sometimes because, um, well, I didn't want to in front of 10,000 people go out, go for something and then fell on my face right in front of me. You know? <laughs> so I also had like two or three kind of go-to ideas for, you know, brother to brother or these kind of songs that we would play. But I would think formative years, I would think playing that great variety of, and even now, you know, I think a lot of, it's kind of accepted now that this, that music back in the seventies and eighties was some of the best stuff ever, you know, sixties, seventies, eighties. And I think a lot of kids now love playing that stuff. They love listening to it. They, they hear the beauty in it too, because there's not a lot of, not unless I mean, watch the Grammys. There's no bands up there with a couple of guitars jamming with each other, like the Almond Brothers or Doobie Brothers or Steely Dan or anything. So that was super form, uh, super formative, 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 formative. That um, was really <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> foundational building. What am I trying to say? You know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, that was a that was great. Um, and back then it was like everybody was chasing. You know, I first heard Robin Ford play with George Harrison in the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we went up there to see 
It was Ravi Shankar and, and, and George Harrison. And George Harrison at the time in his band had Tom Scott from the LA Express, Robin Ford on guitar. I think John Guerin might've been playing guitar, drums. I can't remember. But I remember, I didn't know who Robin was at the time, but um, where we were sitting and they gave out big flyers, of, you know, had big flyers and all the information, all the band members. And um, I remember sitting right in front of it. I'd never seen a guy play 335 like that before. Never heard a Mesa Boogie amp like that before. But I was, you know, you know, I was way far back, but it was directional enough where I really, I was kind of right in front of the guitar and he just killed me. And so from that point on, I bought everything that had Robin Ford's name on it. Of course, Robin Ford, Larry Carlton, Jay Graydon. It had yeah. those guys' names on it. And they always would list them on the covers. So that was kind of life changing for me because I never heard guitar really done quite like that. And so then you read about them in Guitar Player and you find out that they listen to Joe Pass or they listen to, you know, uh, Robert Johnson or whoever. Then you you go down that rabbit hole and you kind of find yeah. out what they did. I found I I never went to their other generation. I respected what they listened to, but I ended up listening to more um, my contemporaries. I mean, my um, the people I mooched off of I, I couldn't go back another generation to the robert johnson i never got into that as much even though i appreciated it but i listened a lot to Dwayne allman and taj mahal and ry yeah. cooter and, and lowell george um so i kind of yeah i kind of like kind of go back one generation there but um yeah seeing live music back in the day um at auburn university living in this little university town they would have some great concerts man we saw i saw led zeppelin there I saw Little Feet just killed there. Um, I saw the Allman Brothers right after Dwayne Allman had died. And that was still really super powerful. I mean, Dickie Betts was playing great back then. I mean, yeah. I listened to him now and his time was <laughs> kind of funny. But man, he had some really interesting ideas. And it, the tone, you know, playing that old gold top uh, straight through a Marshall. I think he used a 100 watt amp. And um, I think Dwayne used a 50 watt. But I remember I was in Germany a couple of years ago and um, I went to a music store. And the guy knew me there and he took me upstairs to his vault and he had Dickie Betts's guitar there. The one, the very first one I'd ever seen in my life. Wow. Yeah. Through the years that he'd gotten refinished, uh, it, the seam was off, you know, it was cause it was a gold top. And, um, and the, he had just sold it to some guy in France for like a, surprisingly got $125,000 for it, but it had been refinished and everything. But, um, I got to play that guitar. I have pictures of me playing the guitar, which is quite a thrill after that being the very first guitar I ever heard live, you know? Yeah. And there's a great blues guitar player, too, I should mention that I guess he's unknown. I mean, the guys down south knew this guy. His name was Billy Earl McClellan. And he was, a, I mean, doesn't that sound like a great southern name? Billy Earl sounds That's, like a. It's definitely southern. Sounds like a Confederate general, doesn't it? Uh, he owns a pickup truck. I guarantee it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Billy was just a sweet guy. He, he was from Lynette or LaGrange. I think Lynette. Um, but he, I knew him in Auburn, Alabama, and he went up to Muscle Shoals in Nashville and did a lot of stuff up there before he died of cancer pretty young. But he played, like, he played Josh Smith early on, you know, when Josh was just coming out. And, and um, But Bill Earl was great, and I used to sneak into a club. I was only 16 years old, but I had really long hair. And these gay guys who ran the club really liked my mother because she worked at the local 7-Eleven store or whatever it was. It wasn't called 7-Eleven, but my father had left. And so she worked there part, you know, every day. So all these guys, all the hippies in all, this little university town in Alabama loved my mother because she was real liberal and she was always reading and she was really cool. And so they used to let me in free. And me and my little brother, you see, my brother was only, you know, 14. And we used to sneak in and play foosball and drink beer at this little club and uh but i used to, more, I used to hear billy earl play and that was the first time i ever heard like a marshall you know through a uh les paul through a marshall and it was the most beautiful thing ever it was just so um back then the combination was just really uh super emotive and emotional you know so yeah. i remember having this that was that was a big you know being able to see live music up close for the first time back then when it was just being made you know it's like when zz top had first come out Right. Before their big hits, you know, and they had, you know. So, yeah. 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 To... You know, it's funny because that's a common response. You know, I don't, you know, I don't script questions, you know, for, for this, you know, I just like to have a conversation. But one thing I always ask is that question. And it's really funny that your response is a common response from so many people that they say I, I was just in bands played a lot of music listened to a lot of music took in a lot and 
that was what helped form me, you know, into the person that I became, you know. You know, there's a lot of young guys. I hear, I hear there's some, I, once again, I don't want to mention their names, but guys that I know pretty well out here in Los Angeles that are great players, but it's something's missing, you know, and I can't feel what it is. It's like, I don't know, it's just some, some kind of, you know, like Woody Allen said, um, I think it was Woody Allen, it might have been somebody else, but he said, the way to a woman's heart is through sincerity and honesty. And if you can fake that, <laughs> uh, and that's what I kind of feel like to the kid, you know, I mean, I hear guys play and they, boy, they sure got the licks right, you know, and they got, and the timing's pretty good. Okay, boo. Um, the timing's pretty good, but there's just something missing. Maybe it's, I don't know. It just sounds like they're going through the motions sometimes. It doesn't sound like it's really right. coming from, it's like they know where to put it and I don't know. It's a, I, but my, my bullshit meter goes off for, and not really bullshit. Just authentic, authentic meter kind of goes off pretty quick. I want to hear some players play? Well, I mean, couldn't it, you... couldn't it be you know uh, a level of of passion for what you're doing? Because some people, you know, some people, you know, some people are looking for money. Some people are looking for attention and fame and a pat on the back and you know those sorts of things. And then other people could care less about any of that and the only thing they care about is how much they love playing and how much they love the music and you can tell that when somebody plays you can you can tell when they play if you know this is something that's really coming from the heart or they're just doing this you know because of whatever you can tell yeah i just wonder what that is it's I, yeah. sometimes it's timing i can hear when stuff doesn't swing it kind of sticks out to me and i and guitar players tend to rush yeah you know, i don't know if because they're getting nervous or they're, they're having to use both hands and sync them up to play i mean i don't know exactly why that is but that drives me crazy um, <laughs> you know one of the things uh, this is this is really you know doesn't really matter but one of the things that has helped me is the fact that i stepped back and i i, I started a david gilmore tribute band right and and uh because i i absolutely love david gilmore you know he's 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 definitely one of my favorites but by by doing it it is it has it has forced me to play completely different than i would normally play you know it, it's forced me to to be more focused on phrasing on the subtleties you know the little nuances that you know that he does that makes what he does so good you know, because most guitar players, and I fall in that category, you know, sometimes tend to just forget about the the song and just jam, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, here's what I got to say. Bleh. There it is. Right. As opposed to, you know, being more cautious and more laid back and more, you know, the conversation flowing you know, really paying yeah, attention yeah. to what I have to say, as opposed to just saying everything I got to say right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, I went out to hear a great jazz player the other night, and I won't mention his name because you know him too, but it was like, number one, I couldn't remember any of the melodies. And that's really important to me. Like that's, that yeah. was one great thing about Alan Holdsworth that, you know, if I could, I mean, I could play something if you want to, there's just, well, he had a couple a couple of things, you know, he would, he always knew how to construct a solo. He'd start off usually something that just draw, you know, um, guys who play really fast, of course, they kind of, it's kind of an onslaught of notes and it's really impressive. But sometimes if somebody starts really simple and soft, you lean closer because you want to yeah. hear what they're going to say, right? So it, draw, right. it draws you in that way. And he holds it to that really great. And I just, I was listening to some stuff he did on um, Jean-Luc Ponty the other day. And then I was listening to Level 42, which is a, pop band back in the 80s who tour uh, he toured with for one tour he was drinking buddies with him back in london yeah and i can't remember they had one big hit um level 40 dude and all their stuff kind of sounded kind of similar same kind of groove but it was very 80s jerry husband played drums with him who was a great drummer um great keyboard player he plays he's just, i mean he's like a phenomenal keyboard player but anyway that's i mean if you could just google alan holdsworth with level 42 it's it's beautiful. It was like pop songs. And there's Alan Holdsworth in the middle of it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Pretty amazing. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what it is, you know, but I know it. I don't know what it, how am I going to say this? You know, I don't know what it is, but when I hear it, I know when it's real, you know.
Right. Well, you can tell once again, we'll step back and we'll look at like your song falling up, mm. you know, that whole song to me is just so restrained. You know, I, it feels like, you know, that you're just, you know, you're saying what you need to say in the moment and you're feeling what you need to feel in the moment and you're not rushing that, nothing. And it's that, just, that, that's one of those examples of songs that I've got on YouTube. There's a million, there's got to be a thousand guys that they're playing that song around the world. I've and done it. Never, well, no, it's, it's a quiet, <laughs> it's totally flattering. And um, I've never been paid a dime for it. You know, what happened was yeah. I remember when I was writing that song, I had some loops. Uh, I had kind of done a rough of the song before Jimmy Johnson or the real drummer played on it. And I, but I'd recorded some, if you listen closely to the backing tracks, there's, um, I was playing uh, Ebo with a Wawa and slide yeah. so i was getting this very vocal when you multi-track it when i had like three three things going at one time you're getting this kind of sound going if i can i don't know if i can do it here so i was getting uh, i was getting like uh, we put three of those together you know and it, it came out to a is really great. It's almost sound like a Bohemian Rhapsody in places. And I, so I was really having fun with that. And I brought the loop, I brought the um, backing track to school and I gave it to one of my students because he wanted to just kind of work it. Because the middle section, the chords go. Uh, and it's kind of yeah. hard to solo to. It's kind of because it's very modal. So you have to be right. careful. It's, you know, you can kind of get by if you have a good enough ear just playing blues stuff. But if you like, you know, if you really start playing scales, you're going to land on some notes that are not right if you don't be careful. Yeah. Anyway, so I gave it to one student and it turns out he ended up going someplace and giving it to somebody else. And the, the backing track is out there. And I found it was being used on this one guy's website. And he was selling them for $7.99, the backing track. And so I hear that track all the time on these uh, YouTube things. I mean, it's flattering, you know. Yeah. But that song was, yeah, that's. Look, I mean, I like the excitement of, you know, of, of difficult, fast playing, but I would never go there first. Yeah. Even when I was a younger player, I'd never really, oh, I'm sure I'm guilty of overplaying stuff just to be impressive out of the gates. I guess certain songs merit that, but, um, but if you hear my new record, I mean, I don't, can you replay any music here? Would you want me to play a song? Would you want to hear? Yeah, if you, if you want to, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I've got a, I've got several, I could, um, I can choose from, but I'll play. Um, I was just thinking about that because I do have them here on um, someplace. Um, I mean, I, t I mean, I don't know. I mean, to me, I'd rather hear two notes played correct than a, a million notes played. You know, that's the the, the jazz player I listened to the other night. We went to the baked potato. John Harrington, the guitar player from Sealy Dan, we've become good friends after we did this class for um, this last year. So we went out to uh, the baked potato to hear uh, some guys, some guys play and. He's a friend of mine. He's a freaking great guitar player, but it's just like all right, my ears were kind of fatigued after the first, and maybe that's just me. You know, I don't. I don't yeah, really say that's not a bad thing. It's just it was um, it was um, <laughs> just kind of funny. Uh, anyway, um, I'm getting myself in trouble here because he's a great guitar. I don't know. Um, okay, so this song is um, well, I'm not sure which one I should play. Um, I'll play this. Well, this one has a pedal steel player, a guy named um, Rich Hinman, who played on, um, he plays with Sarah Borelli. He's a great player, great guitar player. He's like a Greg Lees, if you know Greg Lees is. He plays great pedal steel, great yeah. guitar. And um, so here's the song. This song is called Slither. And this is Jimmy Johnson on bass and um, Rich Hinman on pedal steel. And all the guitars are me and uh, my band, Matt Rohde um, on keyboards and Donald Barrett on drums. Donald Barrett plays with Lady Gaga on Anyway, you ready? Let me know yeah. how the volume. Let me know how the volume is. You bet. Perfect.
you turn it off? Can't hear me no more. You're, you're gone. I can't hear you now. I can't hear you. Mm -mm, I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear you. Sorry about that. But could you hear it okay before? I could, yeah, yeah. Okay, can yeah. You, that's coming through the microphones. You know, let me, I'm so sorry to break it up. Like, that's totally, is a vibe buster, isn't it? No, um, you're good. It sounds great. I love the steel, the, the, the pedal steel behind you, that, that flowing found, you know, Okay, I'm gonna take it from I'm gonna I, I just found it. it's in my I was playing that from a wave on my desktop. Yeah. I'm assuming that's why it wasn't coming through my loop back, which is what I have in my system here. But I have it um um Okay, let me try this. Are you can I can I can I take it where I was? You bet. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. No, you're fine. It's um Oh, that's a drag. I was I was getting ready for my big solo. I I actually haven't listened to it in about uh, a month. I got the CDs yesterday, but I haven't listened to the. Um, so I, so when does the C when's the CD going to release? When's well, it going to be? That's a good question. My guy, um, um, there it is. The guy who's mixing all my stuff is um. The guy who's mixing my stuff is um, wants to wait because he does. He says if I start sending it out to different places now, to like to all the magazines, to CD Baby, then no record company is going to want to touch it. And he wants to kind of see if he if anybody will bite with it first. Uh, I got it. I got Maybe, it. I'm going to start this and see if you can hear this any better. Yeah, okay. I can hear good. I'll fast forward a little bit. Just
was the un. I realized that was up from a, my playlist that's unmastered. So it'll sound bigger than that, but yeah, you can hear. Well, it sounds great. It sounds great. You know, uh, what are you, what are you using to get to get your tone? I mean, it sounds. It's a good tone, huh? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's um. Well, that was my. Uh, I I was using a fifty-seven gold top. Um, that was um. You know, all original. It was a mahogany body, which is kind of rare. Fifty-seven yeah. um, had no maple top on it. So they made some of them. Mahogany. It's my the guy who paid for the record. He has a guitar collection. So I was using that, but I was going through the uh, red plate, which is my favorite amp still um, on the market. They went out of business for a while. Now they're kind of back, but it's, you know, like everybody, they kind of try to copy the Dumble thing, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Where they had the effects loop and the, the overdrive channel, but I just love this amp. I've had this one. It's been my, um, I used pedals for a couple of years there and I was on the road a lot. And I said, oh, I like pedals more, but I ended up realizing that the pedals were just trying to sound like this. Because <laughs> you had you had your own signature uh, drive through exotic, didn't you? Yeah, and I still do, and I still like that. I mean, I yeah. actually I, I like the one they had before that. They made that one after I used the AC. I still like the AC comp. And yeah, that's still my main go to pedal when I on my pedal board. That and the Zen, that and the Zen drive. Yeah, my, both of those I, are great. I have a really old Zen drive. Yeah, and then I put a, I put like I have a really nice. Somebody made me this pre clean preamp that's pretty nice. I'm, I think it's maybe Chase made it for me. The guy, this company called Chase on the East Coast. Yeah. I want to say, um, but because it has it doesn't say anything on the pedal. It's just a blue pedal with the one knob on it, you know. But I right. use that after the um, AC, and I seem to fatten things up a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you uh, like it. I think that I'm really, for one, um, for one, um, for once. You know, I'm really happy with like every song in this record. On the past ones, I can always go, oh man, there's like four songs on that record I really liked. You know, or there's like three on that I can really stand to listen to anymore. And the other ones, I, I mean, I think if I had to do it all over again, or if I could at some point do some of my older songs to redo them, you know, redo them correctly. Because there were a lot of things where like we were cutting corners left and right to make any CDs in the past, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you're when you're on your own, you know, you you have to you know, sometimes you know it's just the yeah. way it is you it's know? like you know i'm a hard peg to sell i mean I'm, i realized uh i used to get bummed out about it but you know i realized that i'm not um i mean i'm not really a blues guy and i'm not a fusion guy like you know scott henderson or holder tim miller i'm not really a traditional jazz guy and i'm not really a rock guy you know so i'm kind of a little bit of everything i think so i, th I think from a from a manager's point of view or an agent, I think they don't know what to really do with my music. Although live, our band just kicks butt, I mean, in a big way. The band yeah. live, I mean, I got, I went through a lot of different guys and there are so many great musicians in Los Angeles, but I kind of ended up with these guys, Matt Rohde, uh, who plays with Jane's Addiction and does all the voice stuff on TV. Um, he plays keys and he's, you know, they're all good friends of mine now. And Travis Carlton has been my main bass player. Yeah. Um, Larry Carlton's son, he's great. Right. He's going out with Steve Gadd's band now. Um, wow. Um, and uh, Donald Barrett on drums. Yeah. Well, that's 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 one of the things about where you are. You're such an impressive lineup of immaculate talent. You know, it's and, it's and now because of because of COVID, there's so many tours that are gone. That, that you know, the baked potato is like. I mean, he, poor Justin has you know 100 people calling him a week wanting to play there, and they're all great. Yeah, I mean, lately they had Jeff Lorber with Jimmy Hazlitt. They had uh, Scott Henderson was there. Uh, this guy Alex Sills has been playing here. Josh Smith, Kurt Fletcher. Uh, I mean, Michael Landau was there. Everybody's been. I mean, lately it seems like every night somebody's great there at the at the club. You know, Dean Brown, Carl yeah. Ryan. Yeah, I used to love to come out there, especially around. You know, in January or February, because then that's when you could get like the conglomerates of like, you know, you'll get Bonamassa and Steve Lukather with, you know, like all these different people together, and it's like it's pure heaven. Yeah, that's a good thing. About, I mean, LA's, it's kind of a shithole in a lot of ways these days, just because there's a lot more homeless people, and you know, it's such a big city that's congested, and it's like some days I go, man, I just, I think I want to go back to, you know, Georgia or Alabama someplace, but um. But the good thing about it is the networking thing. There's this great music. I mean, the other night we were out there um, 
who was I watching that night? I we went to see um, Landau uh, the other night with John Harrington, and 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 sitting next to me was Scott Kinsey, keyboard player, and uh, uh, Raphael Moriera, and uh, Hadrian Farad, Farad, or whatever his last name, the French great bass player. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just everybody's like who was in there was like just kind of a who's who in the audience. Of course, everyone see Landau. Landau's so awesome. Yeah. yeah, he's pretty bad. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for you with the new CD and the new partnership. I mean, I sure hope that, you know, you can get it out there in a big way. And, uh, you know. Well, thanks. You help, you know, with this, this little yeah. podcast. This is cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'm and, you, you know, I'm glad, good... I I'm glad I checked my emails this morning. <laughs> now good now uh our show you know it's it it does pretty well we've got our you know around a million and a half listeners a month now and uh this this year is the first year that guitar talk is actually uh sponsoring some live live music you know we're doing a we're doing an actual buy sell trade guitar show with a with a concert you know attached to it and then we're doing a series of shows with um uh to benefit the guitars for vets organization which i don't know if you are familiar with that but it's an organization that helps veterans with ptsd you know through music uh they're partnered with gibson and stuff like that but anyway uh, if if you don't mind i'd love to reach out to you and find out what it might possibly take to maybe in the fall you know uh have a show in the chicagoland area or maybe the same oh, that'd be awesome. area. i'm sure yeah the plans are, I mean, I don't know much about, I mean, I'm the worst businessman in the world, but my guy who knows more than I do, his plan is to get like a team around me who can actually get me a, some kind of tour. Now, you yeah. know, most, the only guys who have toured Fusion guys has been like the uh, Abstract Logics from the, who had the online uh, presence for a while. And they, when they kind of closed up shop and went offline, they kind of did, um, uh, they kind of had three of their favorites that, that they uh they kind of chose to work with a lot then that was uh osnoy and wayne krantz and mclaughlin i think it was a, those and so those guys seem to be working um with those guys but my guy wants to get another team around me to try to get me out there in, in the clubs and i got some other people who are maybe interested who can get me on the east coast so yeah i hope to get around the i mean i want to play in the united states more I've, I've done a lot of touring abroad and a lot in japan yeah because they're so supportive of the art over there you know and they would right uh, yeah, I used, used to go there like twice a year, you know, and go to like every little city around Japan, which was really fun. And I missed yeah. that. But, um, yeah, yeah, my world has always been the, it was, has been blues, you know, and everybody, we all, everybody goes to Europe. That's where, you know, uh, they're so appreciative over there. And it's, it's really weird because I've become, through this podcast, I've become friends with a lot of great players from all different parts of the world. You know, and it's really sad that a lot of those players, like in Germany and, you know, people in Wales or wherever they are, uh, I, there's a fusion guy. I don't know if you know of Nazim Cream Cree. He's from Algeria, flat out phenomenal player. But those guys never get the opportunity to come here. You know, some of them don't even get opportunities where they are. Like It's weird this, that America doesn't really support yeah. um, that like the other, other countries do. Yeah. Is it? Do you think? You think maybe it's because we're just oversaturated, right? I mean, any anybody with a computer can make an album and put it on Spotify, which is cool. But at the same time, it floods the market so much that it makes it really hard to distinguish yeah. and find things. Well, plus, I just don't think the radio stations, or the I mean, unless it's a little college independent station or something, it doesn't seem like anybody really pushes good music. Mm -hmm. You know, people years ago gave up. You know, if uh, I, I don't know, like a Chris Whitley or a, a, who I happen to like, or, or even Little Feet. Little Feet never had any any success, you know, or bands that would write really great stuff. Nobody, I don't know. It's the, re it's the record business, I guess. It's indicative. Like, like Hunter Thompson said, what is it? The record business is a long, dark corridor full of charlatans and crooks. He goes, and then there is a bad side. <laughs> Something like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, everybody's trying to make a buck and, you know, I mean, in the long run, you're kind of, you're kind of, you're making an art form that's going to be remembered for eternity. And in the short term, you're making a lot of money with stuff that the masses can listen to and, and understand. 
And yeah. that's it. I think there's a kind of a dumbing up of America in a lot of different ways. And it, and it, it kind of is obvious in, in the music. If you watch the Grammys too, I mean, people are, it's more of entertainment and dancing and it's like, whatever happened to like, you know, people sitting around making music together, you know, I mean, there are exceptions of course, every now and then, but it's not, yeah. it's not, um, it's not supported like it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alan, I appreciate, you know, all this time that you've graciously given me and, sure. well, you know, I'm kind, of stuck, kind of stuck here at home with my eye. I can't play tennis um, until that goes away. And so I, um, I'm actually busy trying to learn the internet and trying to do YouTube videos for the first time and uh, get that off the ground. And uh, yeah, and building guitars. I'm always tinkering. Grandpa Hines here in his cellar <laughs> tinkering away with, what are you doing down there, Grandpa? I just got a look at this. I got the guitar uh, today in the mail. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty. Yeah, it's so, nice. So it's just a husk, of course, because I, I have all the parts. I have like some old 63 pickups and stuff I might put in it. And so it'll sound good when I get done with it. But I was going to do this. Uh, my idea on my little YouTube, I was going to, I was going to, come on, boo. Uh, I was going to put this outside on some bricks and go, yeah, I woke up this morning, went out to get a pack of smokes and somebody had, you know, like you know, it used to happen to cars. They did like put cars on blocks and steal all the hubcaps, you know, and I put it out there and say, yeah, they took, I spit it down, probably took it to Mexico. <laughs> I was going to do a little comedy, you know, if I could, but this is um really sweet. Gibson make, is making good. This is a new Gibson, but they yeah. sure are making good stuff again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Quality control is kind of back up. To a good place yeah jc over there has done a, an amazing job you know who's that is that the is he in charge he's of that, the or? ceo yeah oh, okay. yeah he's the ceo I, I did a uh i did a tour of the gibson garage and their private vault you know i don't know if you've seen videos of the vault and that and it's crazy they take you into this room and there's a hallway and it looks like you know just a hallway with a bookshelf and you know, and then he pulls the bookshelf open like you would at, you know, some, you know, secret passageway yeah. at a mansion. And you walk in and there's a, there's this vault of like 12 Gibson guitars behind glass in this room. And it's Gibson's most prized 12 guitars. I mean, it's like wow. serial number number one of a 1957 or 58 uh, Carina V. And you know serial number number one of some year of a les paul and i remember he handed me he handed me the v uh i'll, I'll never forget he handed me the v and i'm looking at it and i'm going oh this is just absolutely gorgeous and i said i hate to go down this path but what is this worth i mean this is number one what's it worth and he goes oh that's about a he goes, oh, that's about a million and a half dollars. And he says, he says, there's probably about 30 or $40 million in this room. And I'm like, oh my God, just absolutely gorgeous guitars. But they've done a, they've done a lot of really good things. I've, I've never, I was never a Gibson guy. I've always been a, a Fender guy personally myself, even though I own a bunch of Gibsons and that, but the work that he's doing and what's going on over there and that, it seems to be pretty impressive to me. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's good, yeah. it's good to know that they're getting back to you know the quality of the, because it's yep. there's so many years where they experimented so much, and that's what I talk about in my little YouTube. I say that, you know there's like when Gibson was kind of suffering trying to make things a little bit cheaper or trying to cut corners here and there. Uh, Ibanez was busy making some good stuff over in Japan, and so mm -hmm. I like you know talk about an Ibanez guitar uh, that I'm gonna. It's coming out next week. It's a little video I made last night. Anyway, um, that's my whole concept is like affordable guitars guitars it kind of went i mean like the great the expensive ones can be great too but a yeah. lot of times i've played a lot of expensive guitars that were kind of dogs i mean just they were expensive because they were old but if they've never been played or just it was a bad combination sometimes it's not they're not always guaranteed to be great guitars just because they're old i guess yeah recently. yeah exactly and same same goes for the the new ones you know some yeah. of the high dollars I, you know i bought a uh pre, i bought a tom quail prestige um ibanez which is an amazing guitar it's absolutely gorgeous but then i was going to turn around i was going to buy one of the steve lukather uh, uh ernie balls and somebody says don't do it get the sterling 
And I'm like the Sterling. That's like buying the, you know, the Squire of the Fender, you know, or the Epiphone right. or the Gibson. Right. I get the Sterling. And I, you know what I did? The difference was $3,500 versus $800. So I bought the Sterling and you can't believe how well it plays, how great it sounds. I mean, I was just blown away by yeah, how good it is. You, every now and then, you know, they would, and they would luck up sometimes on some models that they didn't know at the time were really great. Well, like Les Paul Juniors and stuff, you know. Yeah. But to me, uh, one of the most affordable collectibles is like a '59 Junior because you can still get into those. And the next on those things are just phenomenal. And I have a, I have a '59 Melody Maker, that's mm -hmm. that's that um, I put a humbucker in. If you just want a great neck, this thing is so, it's beautiful. It's really thick. Uh, oh, the it's like really um, but I have this. Uh, I put a humbucker yeah. in it, like an old uh, PAF, and I have this is a um, palm pedal. Like a B bender. Right, right, so right. I can yeah. simulate pedal steel pretty well on this guitar, but this neck is just huge and it's wonderful. It's like this deep Brazilian rosewood because it's 59. But if you want to get into like what a 59 kind of feels like or a junior, you can't afford $10,000 for that Les Paul Jr., this is pretty darn affordable. You can still find these for a couple thousand dollars at the most. Yeah, yeah. And you just swap out and put a good pickup on it. Really cool. Very nice, man. Well, Alan, thank you so much for your time, my friend. I'll let you know when this is going to air, and I'll send you the, the promo stuff for it. And Right on. Well, be well, man. Take care. Be safe. Yeah, you too. And I can't wait to hear the new album, man, in its entirety. Thanks, man. I'll let you. I'll make sure you get a copy. I appreciate that. Take care. Bye, See you, man. Bye. All right, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Alan Hines. Do yourself a favor. Go to Alan Hines' website, follow him on social media, and if you get an opportunity to see him play live, don't miss it. I know he plays from time to time at the Baked Potato there outside of Los Angeles and around in that area quite a bit. Man, you don't want to miss him. I want to thank Alan so much for uh, participating in this episode, and until next time, I'm Jimmy Warren. Thanks for tuning in to Guitar Talk. Guitar Talk.